We're looking, by the way, at two members of the committee, Congressman Lee Hamilton, who is the chairman of the House Committee, and Senator Inouye. It does appear that they're getting ready for a, a change in the, uh, in the technical arrangements in there, and I suspect that this is because they're going to allow Colonel North, either with or without the celebrated slides, to make his presentation. Oliver North at the Iran-Contra hearings continues. This is Congressman Cheney of Wyoming talking to Colonel Oliver North at the moment. In the last few seconds, the committee has decided that because of security considerations, you can't turn the light out in this room, they're not going to be able to see the slideshow. And we're not going to be able to see the slideshow because they don't have the equipment. But we suspect that Congressman Cheney is going to give away his questioning time to Colonel North. Let's listen. key thing for us, Mr. Chairman, is that the permanent record of these proceedings show what, uh, in fact, was in that presentation and that the American people have access to that information. And uh, I would uh, concur in the chairman's statement that it is impossible from a technical standpoint this morning to present the slides in this setting in a manner that would make them uh, available to the public. So I'm going to make the following request, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I ask unanimous consent that the slides uh, that are part of Colonel North's briefing be made a permanent part of the printed record of these proceedings. Before uh, responding to that, uh, I have a question. Uh, how many slides are involved, Colonel? Because I've been told that uh, slides are selected for different purposes. The uh, briefing in its current format, and there were many different formats for it, of course, and we tried to update it, has 57 slides in its center. And is there a written text that accompanies the slideshow? No, sir. Are there notes that you refer to? No, I would, uh, in the format that I gave it in uh, many times, uh, sometimes even up here on the hill, uh, I would simply put the slides up on the screen and describe the, the slides. And of course, the, uh, the contents of the entire briefing demonstrated the Soviet threat in this hemisphere mm -hmm. and how the resistance was uh, Fine, sir. responding to it. Then we are submitting 57. Is that correct, Mr. Cheney? Yes, Mr. Without Chairman, objection, 57 slides will be made part of the permanent record. And secondly, Mr. Chairman, if I might, uh, I ask unanimous consent that the material in the slides be uh, produced in printed form and made available to the press and the public by that means. So ordered. So ordered. Can we have that done today? Uh, is it possible for that to be We will expedite the matter, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman for a question I'll be happy to yield to the gentleman from Illinois mr. Hyde uh, will there be captions on these slides they will be meaningless if they're just reproduced as as pictures unless we know what they portray so somebody had best compose uh, captions for them or uh, as I say I don't think they'll be too helpful I would be happy uh, to ask uh, our staff to work with uh, Colonel North and uh, take uh, the slides and put them out in an appropriate fashion in four colors if the gentleman from Illinois so desires. Accommodate you, sir. Colonel North, uh, in the time remaining to me, uh, I would uh, like to ask you to give us a uh, general description of your briefing, if you will. I'm especially interested in putting on the public record as part of these hearings um, information about the nature and the extent of the Soviet threat in Central America and Nicaragua. All right, sir. Uh, perhaps the best way to do that is to simply go through the uh, presentation as it, uh, as it exists. And I will try to quickly go through the slides and indicate what I would have said had the slides been up on the screen. The first slide simply demonstrates the geography and why this part of the world seems to be of so much interest to the Soviets. The first slide shows the effect of Soviet penetration in this hemisphere in the form of a consolidated communist regime in Cuba and the threat that poses to our sea lines of communication, both to Europe and through the Panama Canal, and the threat it poses to 55% of our oil supplies coming up from uh, Latin America. The second slide uh, is a photograph of Andrei Gromyko, then the foreign minister of uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, a quote from uh, Mr. Gromyko, to the effect that 
He said in Moscow in 1983, the region is boiling like a cauldron. Cuba and Nicaragua are living examples for the countries in that part of the world, talking about their intentions. A second uh, quote from Marshal Ogorkov, then the head of the Soviet Armed Forces in Moscow when he was talking to Maurice Bishop, then the head of uh, Grenada, in which he said, a note taken by Bishop and his people in visiting Moscow in March of 83, the Marshal said, forgive me, The marshal said that over two decades ago, there was only Cuba in Latin America. Today, there are Nicaragua, Grenada, and a serious battle is going on in El Salvador, a 1983 pronouncement by Marshal Argarkov. There is then a summary of Soviet policy in the region based on Soviet literature and summarized that their goal is to create such turmoil in the Caribbean basin that the United States must divert attention and military resources from areas critical to the Soviets. A follow-on slide depicts the fact that the Soviets are outspending us in our own hemisphere on a ratio of about five to one. And that's in 1985's figures, 1984's figures. They have since gotten worse. A photograph showing the Soviet warships deployed in the, in the Caribbean, what used to re be referred to as an American lake, 16 miles off the coast of Louisiana, the Kiev battle group deployed for a refueling and replenishment exercise. A photograph of the Soviet submarines provided to Cuba, and the text that would have gone with it would describe the fact that Adolf Hitler was able to shut down 44% of the shipping from the United States during the opening days of World War II from submarine bases based 4,000 miles away, and these submarines are based less than 200 miles away in Cuba. A photograph of a U.S. Navy F-4 escorting a Soviet Bear F strategic reconnaissance aircraft 13 miles off the coast of the Virginia Capes, and then a re photograph taken by a U.S. reconnaissance platform of the Soviet military facility at San Antonio de los Baños in Cuba. It is that facility which allows the Soviets to recover their reconnaissance aircraft, which fly down the east coast of the United States, and until they complete their base in Nicaragua, they are unable to do so and reconnoitering the west coast of the United States. Then a photograph of the Soviet signals intelligence site at Lourdes, Cuba, by which the Soviets, not the Cubans, but the Soviets intercept our communications, particularly our telephone and satellite communications on which we rely for almost all of our military and diplomatic correspondence via telephone and telex. A photograph showing the militarization of the Cuban children a sixth grade class out for their firing exercises. Then a photograph showing a, a map showing where Cuban forces as the mercenary army of the Soviet Union are deployed, 3,000 in Nicaragua, 400 in the Congo, 35,000 in Angola, 700 in Mozambique, 5,000 plus in Ethiopia, and 500 in Yemen. That chart would have been updated had I still been in my current employ to show the 1,500 now in South Yemen. And the fact is that the Soviets are indeed using the Cubans as a mercenary army throughout the world. To point out that the Soviets weren't satisfied simply with having Cuba, that the militarization of the island of Grenada was first observed by U.S. reconnaissance platforms in the extension and expansion of an airfield at Point Salinas, far in excess of that required for normal commercial operations first cued us to the fact that something was seriously wrong on the island of Grenada. And of course, in October of 1983, the next slide shows some of the Cuban economic aid going to the small island nation of Grenada, some of the packing crates from the warehouses full of weapons, stamped with Cuban economic office and full of munitions. The next slide shows a Chinese uh, rocket launcher probably made in the 1950s, probably captured in uh, in uh, Vietnam, shipped to Grenada, and then the shipping documents for that document, weapon captured in El Salvador, the shipping documents found in Grenada, showing that Grenada was being used as a location to support Soviet designs for subversion and revolution in this hemisphere. And then a photograph of the five secret military agreements found in Grenada after the U.S. rescue operation. 
military agreements with the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, North Korea, Cuba, and Hungary. Somehow we were unable to get those things before the American people in such a way as that they understood what was really happening in this hemisphere. It has not only happened in Cuba, it is now happening in Nicaragua. The next slide shows simply a map of Nicaragua describing the fact that the, this country of about the size of Iowa or Michigan, a country with about three million in population, the only country in Central America with a decrease, or Latin America with a decreasing population, and why that population is decreasing is because of the internal repression perpetrated on the people of Nicaragua. It shows the, the growth of the active duty forces in the, in the Sandinista military machine, an enormous military buildup supported by the Soviet Union. The next, slide sh next series of slides shows some of the military equipment on which I've already been questioned, but it shows the T-55 tanks now numbering over 150 the PT-76 tanks and the armored personnel carriers numbering over 300. The buildup taken from reconnaissance platforms at Sandino Airfield turned from a civilian air facility under Somoza into one of the most sophisticated military facilities in Central America. This is the armored, temp armored uh, storage area at El Tempisque built along the Cuban model. The special airfields built by the Soviets to support their, and the Cubans, to support the Sandinista military operations along the northern tier of that country, the construction of another armored storage area inside Nicaragua, the construction of a major port facility along the Pacific coast in order to uh, handle the offload of Soviet military supplies being delivered along the Pacific coast at Corinto, two shots of that, a photograph of the Soviet and Bulgarian Cuban construction being con conducted at Punta Huete along the Atlantic coast, for the first time, the Soviets will have the ability not only to deliver, they can do it pier side, and the construction of an airstrip at uh, El Bluf Bluefields, which uh, the Soviets are supporting. An aerial reconnaissance platform photograph of Punta Huete, the largest airfield south of the Rio Grande, bigger than Andrews Air Force Base, which is capable of launching and receiving any aircraft in the Soviet inventory to include the reconnaissance aircraft shown in the earlier slides allowing them to reconnoiter the west coast of the United States, or even if they wish to recover backfire bombers at such a location. The next slide shows some of the supplies delivered to the Sandinistas during the period of Soviet support, which began not in 1982, but in 1979. The first of them shows one of the MI-8 HIP helicopters. Delivered originally as agricultural support equipment, it shows some of the unique agricultural support uniforms and of course the party emblem next to the agricultural rocket launcher on the side of the aircraft. The next photograph is the Soviet Hind helicopter, the most sophisticated assault platform in the world today. It has been delivered by the dozens to the Sandinistas, assembled by Soviet technicians and test flown by them, is flown by, Soviet, by uh, Cuban and Nicaraguan pilots against the resistance and to intimidate their neighbors. There's also a photograph of a Soviet AN-30 reconnaissance aircraft flown by Soviets in this hemisphere, not Cubans, not Nicaraguans, marked neatly with aerofloat markings on the side, photographed surreptitiously from an aircraft landing at Sandino Airport. Some quotes from the Ortega brothers and the band of folks down in, El Sal in, in Nicaragua, in which Somehow we have been unable to explain to the American people what their real intent was in bringing about this revolution. And I think the quotes are important because it really does depict what they've been saying all along. In 1981, Humberto Ortega, the defense minister, interestingly enough, a mirror image of what is going on in Cuba. The minister of defense in Cuba is the brother of Fidel Castro. The minister of defense in Nicaragua is the brother of El Presidente. Daniel Ortega. Humberto has said, Marxism-Leninism is the scientific doctrine that guides our revolution. Our doctrine is Marxism-Leninism. And he said that in August of 1981. And what he is saying in every other word is that communism is what they want. And this was being said at a time when we somehow couldn't explain to the American people effectively that these people really were communists and they were all along. Bayardo Arce, any investment project in our country belongs to the state. 
the bourgeoisie no longer exists, it subsists. 1984, the, the, the great political thinker, the Che Guevara in many respects of the current revolution in Nicaragua. Tomas Borges, the Minister of Interior. He doesn't run the national parks, he runs the secret police. You cannot be a true revolutionary in Latin America without being a Marxist-Leninist, said in Havana in 1984. And then two photographs of Mr. Ortega and some of his associates, one with Fidel Castro, and then with some of his other brothers in arms, in this case, the uh, leader of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, shown with Tomas Borges and uh, the Minister of Interior and the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Miguel de Scotto, along with uh, Mr. Gaddafi on the uh, deck of a Korean gunboat. There are then a series of photographs which show the attempt to subvert their neighbors. In one case, a Lada automobile I described the other day, which crashed into a bridge abutment in an automobile accident in Honduras, and then the photographs showing what was inside that automobile to include the counterfeit money, the arms, the ammunition, the Soviet bloc radios, the code sheets, all of the things of subversion for subverting their neighbors. Then there are two photographs showing the arms captured after the M-19 assault on the Supreme Court in which the entire Supreme Court of Colombia was murdered. All the records of the drug running that was perpetrated and supported by the M-19 guerrilla faction, all of the weapons in those photographs originated in Nicaragua. Then a photograph of, that starts a series on what has happened to the people of Nicaragua. A photograph of one of the 11 new political prisons inside Nicaragua, a photograph of one of the victims with his arms and uh, face terribly burned from having been uh, trust bound, thrown into his Pentecostal church and set, a set a fire while he was alive and he managed to push himself out of the church. A photograph from a Nicaraguan school book printed in East Germany or Cuba showing how young Nicaraguan children learn to count by counting grenades and AK-47. And of course, the textbooks talk about anti-imperialism and anti-Americanism. A photograph of some remarkable uh, quantity, quality, showing an entire town which fled in their Sunday best across the border simply to go to church on Sunday, wearing everything that they had because they could never go back home. A series of photographs showing the dislocation of the Mosquito Indians, 25,000 to 30,000 of which have been driven from tribal homelands across the border into Costa Rica and Honduras, bringing with them their entire culture. Left alone for hundreds of years, these people no longer can go home. Then some photographs showing the Nicaraguan resistance. It shows the young men and women who have taken up arms because they've been denied any other recourse in their own country. It shows the 57-year-old coffee farmer who I described earlier, who came home and found his entire family murdered by the Sandinistas because they gave water to a passing Contra patrol. A series of photographs showing how the resistance looks as a consequence of the assistance I am accused and admit to having delivered. A photograph showing the leadership of the FDN. And in that photograph of 16 men, 11 of them are former Sandinistas. A photograph of a resistance unit crossing into uh, Nicaragua. Another one of a patrol deep inside Nicaragua. A photograph of a wounded resistance soldier who benefited from that, that we provided during the cutoff, and then a photograph of what it looked like before that help arrived. A photograph of the emergency aid station and intensive care unit, which is nothing more than a field tent without even mosquito netting. A photograph of the plastic maps that they were forced to draw their own battle plans and patrol routes on because we couldn't even give them that. And then finally, a photograph photograph showing the grave of a resistance fighter. And the conclusion of the briefing is, gentlemen, that we've got to offer them something more than the chance to die for their own country and the freedoms that we believe in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Colonel North. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Chair recognizes Senator McClose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Colonel North. And I Mr. Chairman, before commencing my questioning, thank you for the accommodation that was reached in order to allow 
Colonel North to make the presentation that he has. And I think without asking the committee to enter into the stipulation which uh, Senator Rudman offered earlier, on behalf of himself, he stipulated that indeed this presentation followed as it was in other settings by contacts of other people did not in and of itself constitute a solicitation of funds. And I think Senator Rudman's words were that he would stipulate that those activities were not, that you did not and you had not been involved in raising funds in these activities. Uh, I, I say that because I realize that every member of the <coughs> two committees that are here will make their own judgments about that fact, and so will the American public. But I do want to at least follow uh, Senator Rudman's suggestion to the extent of, to the extent that I can, by my remarks, indicate that I too think the record is ex very, very clear that you were very, very careful that you did not personally solicit money. That is correct, sir. You've testified to that, and uh, while some say, well, you went right up to the line that indicates you tried to get over it, while others are saying you went up to the line and you carefully followed the law that was in effect at that time. I did, sir. Colonel North, I want to go back in just a few minutes and uh, kind of reconstruct where we are on the basis of your testimony and what it is this committee is really, these committees are really about. <coughs> Our charge is to find out, indeed, what was U.S. policy in Iran? What was U.S. policy as reflected by the evolution of our policy with respect to Iran, and what does that mean with respect to the evolution of that policy? What were the influences? How did it come about? What were we really about? And secondly, the point that we began in these hearings, uh, what was this Contra network, and how did the two get mixed together? I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I do want to get uh, get the background laid very quickly, and I, I will ask you if indeed you agree or disagree with my summary, and I hope indeed if you disagree you'll state it briefly, and if you agree, just state that. If I understand your testimony to this point, the United States was approached by representatives first from Israel and then from Iran, suggesting that we uh, open a dialogue with elements inside Iran looking towards the time when there would be a different regime and a different relationship between the United States and that new regime in Iran. Am I correct? Yes, and to assist in furthering that change of regime. Uh, and I, I would submit from my own standpoint that any administration that was given any hint uh, that that was possible and did not pursue that opportunity would be derelict. Not because we like Khomeini, because obviously we do not. We're not seeking to deal with Khomeini. We're seeking to find a way to deal with a different government in Iran than the one that exists there now, recognizing the importance of that country geostrategically and also economically because of the importance of oil to the world's economy. Am I correct? Yes, sir. That from that initiative, the, the representatives of this country and of Israel began exploring ways in which that might be accomplished. And in that process, we ran into some rather strange bedfellows. People like Mr. Gorbanifar, who made suggestions, in spite of the fact that we didn't really have any reason to trust him, but nevertheless, he made suggestions about the means by which we could accomplish the end of making contact with those elements in Iran. And among those suggestions was, you've got to prove you're really serious. Who is this guy, Colonel North, or who, wh whoever else the representatives might have been of the United States? Were you really speaking for the President of the United States? Show you're serious. Show you really speak for the United States. And uh, that gave birth to the notion of proving bona fides by supplying arms. Is that correct? That is my understanding of how it in initiated because I was not there at the conception, uh, if you will. Uh, Colonel North, this isn't a summary because you haven't yet testified to this fact, but isn't it a fact that Israel was already involved in arms trades with Soviet Union, uh, with uh, Iran, involving, involving not only arms which they produced themselves inside Israel, 
but also arms which had been supplied by the United States to Israel. Apparently so, yes, sir. So that this was not an unprecedented or new idea so far as the relationships between Israel and Iran were concerned. We do not believe it was. That following that time, we, it was suggested, and I think again suggested to us by representatives of Israel, that Iran could prove their bona fides with us by putting pressure upon the Lebanese captors of U.S. hostages to put pressure upon them to release hostages as an evidence of the fact that they indeed had clout within their own government. Yes. And that led to what has been described as the arms for hostages transactions. That's correct. Rightly or wrongly, that's the way it evolved. It did. It was also suggested to us that if you really want to get any kind of a new relationship with Iran, you got to solve the question of hostages first, because no responsible American government can deal with a government in Iran so long as Iran has the key or can put pressure upon those who do have the key that locks up our hostages. Exactly. So it wasn't hostage generated from the beginning, but hostages were both a means of proving bona fides and also as removing a roadblock to the evolution of that kind of a new relationship with a new element inside Iran. Correct. Fo following that then came the escalating demands and the difficulties that came along with those escalating demands in the arms transactions with Iran and the, and the pressures that would result in the release of hostages. And there were a whole series of those difficulties. Certainly were, sir. No, I've, I've been intrigued, and I asked earlier what witnesses about this, I've been intrigued by the fact that Israel, who is so competent in so many ways, screwed up that arms tracks and transaction so badly. Did it ever, the November one? Yes. And they had had successful arms transactions for a long while. But suddenly, in November, <laughs> at about the time the United States was about to withdraw from the whole initiative, they suddenly have a stranded arms shipment stranded in Portugal because they didn't have the right kind of clearances, because they're trying to fly, fly shipments in, in air, aircraft with Israeli markings, whole host of different kinds of problems, all of which should have been very familiar to them. Is that correct? Yes, and I have tried not to hypothesize, although many have, as to why that happened. But did it cross your mind at the time that that's odd, that this, that this group of people who are so very, very competent in so many different ways and have carried on these arms trade, this arms trade for a period of years, suddenly finds themselves in grave difficulty on a shipment and have to ask us for help at the very time that we're about to withdraw from the entire initiative. It did, sir. But nevertheless, we did at, at some time about then uh, uh, begin to have further overtures from Israeli agents. And I think you've testified that Gorbanifar was an Israeli agent. At least that's how he was seen by our intelligence services. So, so you believed at the time I, that he, uh, the contacts that I he was I believe then and I agent. believe now. That, that indeed, uh, the, they wished this to go forward and they were trying to find a way to persuade us to go forward. Yes. And as a matter of fact, uh, you had meetings with Mr. Neer, I believe, during the, at the end of December or early January, and uh, nothing was said about the diversion of the funds or the use of the funds derived from arms sales with respect to Contras, he was talking about the use of proceeds for other covert activities. That is correct. And, you, and, and the U.S. government at that time, both yourself and others, were still saying no. That's correct. I think Mr. McFarland had made a trip to London and he came away and said, it's done, it's finished, this is a bad deal, let's don't go any further with that. That had occurred before your meeting with Mr. Neer. I don't recall the meeting quite as emphatically as that, but uh, certainly Mr. McFarland expressed reservations about continuing on if all that we could get was Mr. Gorbanifar as an intermediary. 